uh, sermon title today is Eyewitness News. So we're witnesses for God. So I could make you raise your right hand, and you know, but you're definitely going to tell the truth. So. Please join in the bold print. The apostles were brought in to appear before the Sanhedrin for questioning by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you have killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are his witnesses to these facts, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Very good. The witness may take their seats. Very good. Speaking of being witnesses, telling people about Jesus, we have a special ministry going to be performed right here with Phil Kaufman, who just stole our secretary. Um, the flyer is in the back on the bulletin table, and if you would like to go ahead and buy tickets, it's not really buying, it's a $10 suggested donation, but he will be at the Grace Theater on April 27th, and he will be here on May 5th. So on Saturday, May 4th, we're going to have the whole stage transformed for his production, so we'll see that here. But the tickets are back there, and there's a basket if you want to go ahead and make a donation. Otherwise, make sure you know about that one. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We'll practice that again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You know, Lent lasts 40 days, and we're used to that because we have those Lenten luncheons, which are so wonderful. But Easter lasts 50 days, so we're supposed to be doing that for seven weeks for Easter. On the second Sunday of Easter, Jesus' resurrection, we're going to be talking about how we're eyewitnesses to this good news. Last week, we talked about how that small seed, like a little apple seed, when you plant it, it looks like it's gone, it's buried like it's dead, but suddenly it grows into a huge tree that produces fruit, and none of that looks like the little seed. In the same way, Jesus' small transfer, his resurrection transforms the entire world from this small event that's not only impossible, but they didn't have TV cameras, they didn't have anybody to report on it, they didn't have newspapers. All they had was regular people like us, and suddenly, that seed has grown into this enormous mon mountainous tree that's produced fruit for 2,000 years and will continue to do so for the rest of eternity. We saw a little bit how David was an example of this transformation, how he went from a simple shepherd to a singer-songwriter to a soldier to the sovereign of the entire country. Well, today we're going to look at how God makes us transformed. We are not who we were. And we are not who we are going to be. Today's scripture that we read shows us how seeing is believing. I like Thomas. I, I hate that he gets a bad rap. Of course I'd want to see some evidence, you know? And you know, they called him the twin, which there's a theory about that, that they called him, the, they nicknamed everybody. Peter, Jesus called Peter the rock. He called James and John, John the sons of thunder. He was always nicknaming people. And they called Didymus the twin, which I assume meant because he looked like Jesus. He was probably Jesus' look-alike twin. And he was also the fella, when they were heading to Jerusalem before this, they said, Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. You have a, a warrant out for your arrest, and we'll be, we'll be arrested, and you'll probably be killed. And it was Thomas, if you remember, is the one that stood up, doubting Thomas, and he said, if Jesus is going to die, I'm going to die. I'm going with him. And everybody else fell in line with Thomas. So I just wanted to add that to the Scripture reading. Last Sunday, we read about the ladies of the church. The first ones there, they got up early to take care of Jesus' body, and apparently they keep getting here early to make the coffee and things like that, although Russ and I do a pretty good job of making coffee too. So, There were two groups of ladies in the Easter story. Remember, there was the one group that left, they fled the tomb trembling with astonishment, and they said nothing to nobody. And then you had the other lady who met Jesus, and went and told everybody that Jesus is alive, and hardly anybody believed her. So the point is, we need to be like Mary, be witnesses for Jesus, even if we don't see results right away. Today's scripture says we are witnesses, and the readings teach us three things, as does the first hymn, 
that we get. It says, if we see that God is at work in our lives, it will make us more joyful. The Bible said the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Being an eyewitness will also make us more peaceful. Jesus said three times today, be at peace. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And then he breathed on them. You have to get really close to someone to breathe on them, right? He got really close to them, and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit, and now you have the power. If you forgive anyone's sins, don't think about it. They're forgiven. But if you don't forgive people's sins, who's going to? It won't get done. And the third thing that God gives us today, of course, seeing God at work in our lives, being a witness to these things, it makes us Jesus' witness. We have to tell other people. The Bible said today that the other disciples told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And then later in Acts, the second reading, they stood up and they said, we are witnesses, along with the Holy Spirit, that God raised Jesus from the dead and raised him to be with himself a prince and savior to bring others to repentance and to forgive their sins. You're hearing a common theme there, right? You and I can have that same joy, that same peace, that same power, that same mission to forgive people's sins as the first disciples, the first apostles. But they didn't just see it or we never would have heard about it. We have to see these things that God is doing in our lives and we have to tell someone. Have you ever um, taught a class or you've been in school and the teacher says, does anybody have any questions? Why do they say that? Because if you have a question, probably three other people have that exact same question, right? If you feel God moving in your life and you say something about it, I cannot tell you how many people tell me this. When one person shares what God is doing in their life, other people all around say, the same thing has been happening to me. And it's like a ripple effect. And that's how Jesus comes alive for all of us. When's the last time you and I have ever brought someone to Christ? Maybe you don't know what impact you've had. Maybe you don't know the thing you do has been that spark that's led them one way or the other. We talk a lot about church. Did you know that um, about half the people in the country go to church reg pretty regularly? The other half don't. And you would think that those other half are non-Christians. But the Billy Graham Institute, I'm in this little Billy Graham cohort thing, they just did a study. It looks like two-thirds of the people that don't go to church are actually Christians. They're actually people who love Jesus and are following Jesus. So they can do that first commandment, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. They do love God. It's the second commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. It's very easy to not love the other people in church or the people that you're bumping into. You have to do that, though, to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. And a lot of times it sounds like when we talk about getting people to go to church, say, well, my friends have heard bad things about church or people did bad things. But we also do really, really good things. And so we need to talk to people about those good things that we're doing and give them the opportunity to say, hey, maybe that's something I want to be a part of. Getting being, a, being an eyewitness is tricky business, though. How many of you have ever seen an accident or a fight or some incident and you had to be an actual witness to something? Anybody seen anything like that? Have you ever heard stories where someone will have a car accident and there will be witnesses and every witness will have a different story about what happened? It's very risky business because everybody sees things different, especially about faith and God. But it's also a tricky business to be a witness to God and trying to let people see that, yes, you have sins, you've done things wrong, and they've done things wrong, and get them to the point where they can accept that they've done something wrong so that they can repent and receive the forgiveness that Jesus gives. I was thinking if you had a traffic accident, though, and you had all these witnesses, and they four of them see four different things, I'm not sure that would be helpful to the cops. But if you were that witness and you told the police, you know, this is the fourth accident I've had at that stop sign next to my house, that might be helpful to them. Because then you're saying, there's a problem here. This stop is dangerous. And then maybe the city could fix it. There's an old joke about a guy who gets rear-ended um, on a street and he gets out just furious, and he says to the other driver, he says, you're the fourth horrible driver that's hit me this month. Well, obviously, he's the common denominator, right? So he's probably got a little involvement in that, those wrecks, but he can't see it, he can't admit it. 
we may say that we just can't be witnesses for Jesus because we're, we just don't know enough. We're not smart enough. We're not good enough. We've messed up. But we all, if we learn from our mistakes, learn from even the unfair things that happen to us, that God's got us through, that that mess that we're so ashamed of or we think unqualifies us, that mess becomes our message. That mess is our message that we're witnessing to. And we can say, look, I'm not perfect, but look what God did with me. Each one of us, each one of you, has seen God work in your lives. You have spent in your life probably hours praying. You've heard hundreds of sermons. Not as many as good as this one, I'm sure, but no. You've been to church, worship. I did the math this morning. I've probably been to church thousands of times, and I'm sure you've been to church thousands of times. We've read millions. There's almost a million words in the Bible. And so as many times as we've read it, we've probably read millions of God's words. And yet Hebrews 5 says this, By now you ought to be teachers, but you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Solid food is for the mature who by constant use train themselves to distinguish good from evil. So we aren't just called to be witnesses, bystanders. We're called to take the stand. We're called to say something. To do. We're not called to just be members of a church. We're called to be ministers who serve and go out as missionaries. A few weeks ago, we did a survey here of the church members, and the results were phenomenal. Russ tallied them up and got them to me. Very informative on a preference scale of what we want to see God do here, where 100% would be the average. More Bible study was only 66% priority. And both worship and more outreach were 89% our priority. What do you think our top priority was? It was adding more members. 150%, a whopping huge number. We have a good vision of what we want to see God do. And that's great goal. But getting there is exactly the opposite of what we think. We have to learn what God's Word says first and worship and pray more and do outreach and then the fruits of more members will come. Zig Ziglar, the famous sales coach, says, you can get everything in the world that you want as long as you give enough other people what they want. And what they want, whether they know it or not, is to see Jesus at work in their life, to have Him so close that He's breathing on them and to give them that overflowing joy and that peace and that power to forgive and then to have a purpose to go out and live their life for some meaning. That is what many people are hungry for. And we're ready to do that. I am so proud of the survey from our church because almost unanimously, everyone said they're willing to give something up that we love, change something that we do that we're used to as tradition, offer some prayer or our time or other support to make new things happen. And we have a very wise focus on where that growth will come. I'm the only person in this church who said I want more 60-year-old and older people. Every one of y'all want younger people. So either the pastor is completely off or I see something that you might find interesting and useful. So we can talk about that later. But some of us said that we wanted the 0 to 24 crowd. And we're starting that. We've got the kids club and we've got things growing. But that age group takes an awful lot of people resources. I can think of a few ways, though, that we can adjust what we're already doing to focus on that younger group. When I, um, when I first came here, a couple of people said, David, can you offer a messy church? You know what messy church is? It's a Wednesday night meal church where the families can just come right after school or work and they can have a lasagna or some meal and the kids have an art project. So you sing songs, you, work. you have church on Wednesday night, but it's, it's messy church, right? It's fun and it's foodie. Over the next two or three years, I was wondering, we do the Lenten lunches so well, I was wondering if we could somehow expand what we do on Wednesday. Maybe we already have enough food. Maybe we need to make a little bit more food or adjust the time a little bit so that we have a Wednesday Lenten component, like a lot of the churches do, a soup and salad, so that we can expand to that time where the age group that we say we want to reach can come. Because right now we have mainly retirees or people that can come during the middle of the day. Kids Club, by the way, ends on May 17th, and they are very excited. And by excited, I mean very excited. So uh, I will probably be getting an invitation to you all, but please feel free to come to the pizza party on May 17th at 4 o'clock in the Lovejoy Library. It's going to be fun. By far the majority of our members, though, wanted this um, 
crowd between the 30s and 40s and 50s to be part of our church family. That's a great goal to target. Because if you have a vision of what you want, then it makes planning easier. You can always simply ask, is what we are about to do now helpful in learning about, meeting, attracting, or serving people in this 30 to 60 age group? And if it is, then we do it. And if it's not, then we don't. Because otherwise, if we keep doing things that wear us out, that aren't going toward our goal, then we're not going to have the energy, the resources to do anything else. When I was an officer in a, officer school in the Air Force, we had a group that went through training, and we won this award called the Top Flight Achievement. It means we were the best flights of all the, all the 10 or 15, 20 flights in the school that, that, that class. We did not win that because we were the best. We were, in fact, not the best at anything at all. And we didn't even think we were very good at anything at all. But we tried really hard. We fought really hard. We worked really hard. And we were shocked when we won. Our motto was, lead, follow, or get out of the way. <laughs> Pretty tough motto. <laughs> but fortunately, Jesus does not want us to get out of the way. He wants us to join him in learning the way to lead others to him. The church is a really unusual group. It is not made for those that are inside, but is made intentionally to reach out to those outside. If we focus on only member events, and member benefits, it will not lead the time and energy we need for member recruitment. This all may surprise you, but Jesus does not want followers. I look through the Bible. He wants learners. He calls them disciples. He wants leaders. He wants you to go out and do something with the, the gifts he's given you. But nowhere in the Bible can I find a Christian referred to as a follower of Christ, which is the thing we say all the time. I, th I think I said it in the prayer this morning. Some translations do add it, but I went to every one of those occurrences, and it's not in the Greek. The translators just add that word followers in. Christians are called disciples because we're meant to learn. We're called apostles because we're sent out. We're ambassadors. We're like little franchises or signposts all around the world that are witnessing to what God is doing. Last week, as Russ mentioned, the Sri Lanka churches were attacked at Easter, killing 300 and injuring over 600. Those 1,000 families will never be the same. Nor will the millions around the world that heard that and thought, man, I don't know if I want to go to church. I don't know if that's safe. Many of the articles in the newspaper that I read around the world had a huge headline that said, and I assume that they were echoing the pain of these 1,000 families that said, where is God? People are asking that same question in their lives and in their hearts if not out loud, and the answer is in you. You're the only one that has the answer for the people around you. You are called to the witness stand to let them know what you have seen and heard. So how can you take that joy, that peace, that power that you have and share a little of what you've learned with others? Pastor Charles Stanley says we have to be trained to discern, to tell the difference between what is helpful and what is harmful, to use what they the Adam and Eve story called the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. The first step is the same one that Adam and Eve needed to avoid. We just needed to obey God. They didn't obey God, right? They wanted to grab that fruit themselves. They wanted to decide what was right and wrong, what was good and evil. What was... It didn't work. We can't let our pride run away from us. We can't do things our own way. It is easy to let power go to our heads to think that we've been to church so much that we must know what's best for church. But do you see your ministry producing fruit? Do you see people coming to Christ and strengthened in their faith? Do you see them having more joy and more peace and more love and more forgiveness after they've been with you than before? For years, I this week I had a great miracle. For years I've worked on this particular data thing. I'm analyzing data, trying to... And I've, I've run the numbers. I've, I did everything. And it just wouldn't come out right. And after a lot of prayer this week and faith, God didn't need to change the data. The data never changed. What he needed to change was me. And he had, I can almost feel the bones in my brain cracking as he rearranged the way I was approaching this problem. And he had me look at it a completely different way and then miraculously, like I had found an emerald in the ground, 
the data just came together. Do you see your church family growing in love and spiritual death? It's, the Bible says that God adds to our numbers daily those are being saved. Do you see people repenting and giving their life to Christ? Because that's the me measure, tangible results. And if it's not happening, then maybe we need to come at the data a different way. Perhaps doing the same thing the way we've always done in the same way is not the best way to a new success. But in America, or at least with me, impatience and pride are pretty common traits. We want what we want when we want it. More people, more money, more freedom, more food, more information, and we want it fast. Like me, I think we, most of us think we know best. We trust ourselves. We love ourselves. But when we do that, we miss the possibilities. Humility does not mean you think less of yourself. It just means that you think less. You think of yourself less. You think of my way less. You're like, okay, that's what I think, but what does somebody else think? Philippians 2 said Jesus was our model. Be humble and give honors to others even more than yourself. And this way you'll have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God was something he should hold on to. No one has done anything to be more humble than Jesus. He came from heaven to earth. He became a person and was obedient to death when he did not have to die. He came to live for us and to give his life for us and then be raised for us so he could bring us up with him. The key here is to get as close so you can feel Jesus' breath. Spend time with Jesus and you will, and I will become more like him, more humble, and we'll build that relationship with God where we have that peace and that joy and that strength. But the church that Jesus made is not a fast food restaurant. God is more interested in quality than speed. Jesus' church is not about membership or people's comfort or building a beautiful building. It is the only institution on earth that's sole purpose is to bring people to eternal life in Christ. And that is not easy. The Bible says it takes wisdom to win souls. And I got news for you. We aren't instantly wise. Going to school doesn't make you wise. Working a job for 30 years doesn't make you wise. Getting older doesn't make us wise. Though I do seem to get more handsome as I get older. We do not become expert witnesses in the court of the world simply because we go to court every day. The Bible says we must, quote, study to show ourselves approved so we're rightly able to divide the word of truth. We have to spend time with Jesus in his word and feel his breath on us. And we have to learn to see the world the way he sees it. That maturity in the realm of spiritual discernment. You and I may have maturity in a lot of different areas, but I'm talking about spiritual area. You can be a 40 or 60 year old successful person in many ways and have a baby faith, a spiritual life that's small. And so you, may, you and I may do all these things we're good at to compensate for the thing that really matters the most that we're not so comfortable with. I ask everybody, I ask my mom and Stan, I said, you know I'm kind of busy this week. Stan took me out to eat several times. I had more food this weekend than I think I have in the last month. But when I asked them if they would preach for me, oh, no, no, I can't do that. Can fly on a plane all around the world, but can't stand up here and do Every one of you should be able to preach a sermon. We shouldn't have to have this young man from college from Minnow Haven come in all sermon. Why? Every single one of you should be preaching. It's not that hard. I make it look easy, but it's not. Dr. Stanley said that the lack of godly wisdom is caused by simply one thing. We are ignorant of the Scriptures. And that's what, the fact that we don't know Scriptures, like Bob comes in here and he gets his heart, if you don't mind me drawing attention, centers his heart on God, how? By opening God's Word and just listening. What do you think, God? What do you think? Because without that, it causes apathy, complacency, and it failure to grow. So what are eyewitnesses? We're curious. Like nosy neighbors, right? We want to know what's going on. If I have red lights flashing next to my house, I'm looking out the windows like, what's going on over there? I'm going to find out. That's, witnesses are nosy. You know, we were curious. Leaders are curious. We want to be aware of our surroundings and eager to find out what other people know. Eyewitnesses should be listeners and lookers. That way we can teach other people that we meet to also be listeners and lookers by our example. Listeners and lookers and learners who are looking to Jesus.
listening to Jesus, learning from Jesus. Because when they asked Jesus why he came in Luke 19.10, he said one simple thing. He knew exactly why he was here. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. And that's our entire mission. I want to close with one point. It's a big point, so don't... Russ does the announcements very quickly, so I have plenty of extra time to preach. I thought I was going to have to cut stuff out. And we got cushiony seats, so... But one point. When Jesus said that in Luke 19.11... It was in the middle of a very interesting story where he brought someone to faith, and that person stood up, Zacchaeus. You know who Zacchaeus is? That little short guy who was a, they say he's a tax collector. I don't know if you know what a tax collector is, but it's not a tax collector. A tax collector back in that day was in charge of collecting revenue and then issuing contracts for major building projects. So if roads need to be built, public facilities need to be improved, their job was to collect the taxes, organize all the workers, make the project happen, and then make a little profit off of it. These were pretty important, pretty sophisticated people. And when little Zacchaeus had Jesus over to his house that day, Jesus somehow, in his wisdom, converted that fellow. And he said, stood up. He probably stood up on a chair because he's kind of short. He stood up and he said, Jesus, I'm not only giving my life to you, but I'm giving my money to you. And money was important to him. And he said, and if I've ever wronged anybody, I will pay them back like three or four times what I shorted them on the account. And that was the beginning. And when that happened, they asked Jesus, what's going on? You, you've got this guy who cares nothing about you know, religious things. And Jesus said, the reason I came was to save people one at a time. And then he broke into this story, which I think you'll find, and I'll close with this story, this parable of the minus. How many of you ever heard of the parable of the minus? You've heard of the parable of the talents, right? Remember that one, parable of the talents? That word was so obvious that we took that word, talent, which means basically, um, oh, I can't remember now, um, 15 years of wages, that's what it was, a talent. But a minus is only three months of wages. It's a quarter, a fiscal quarter. My mom's an accountant, so I threw some accounting in there for you, Mom. The story of the minus, there was a guy who was born of noble birth. He was from an important Princeton family. And he decided he was going to go off to Springfield. It said he went off to a far-off country because he wanted them to make him king. And when the people in town heard what he was up to, they got a posse together, a delegation, and they chased after him. And they wanted to tell the emperor, don't let this guy be king. We don't want him to be king. Well, they made him king. Got what he wanted. But before he left, he called ten of his servants, and he gave each of them a minus. Not a plus, but a minus. He said, you owe me three months' wages... Here it is in gold in advance. But when I come back, I want to make some money off my money. Well, he became king. He came back. First thing he did, let's see the books. Bring that money back. Where's my three months? Where's my minus? The first guy came forward. He said, here is your minus, plus I have earned ten more. I don't know how many months that is. Eight, ten, thirty months. That's uh, five years. Uh, do the math for me, Russ. A lot of money. He said, well done, my good servant. You were trustworthy in this small matter, and now I will put you in charge of ten cities. He's going to rule ten cities, now he's king. The second came and said, sir, your mina has earned five more. Now notice, they didn't say the money you gave me. He said, your mina earned you the money. He's given the whole thing to you, God. And his master said, you are going to take charge of five cities. But then another servant said, sir, here is your mina. I kept it hidden away, wrapped up in a cloth. Because I'm afraid. You're a hard man, and you take what you don't work for. The man became furious and said, Then why did you not put my money on deposit so when I came back at least I could collect interest? And he said, Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten mina. And all the servants said, Sir, he already has ten. And he replied, Notice he let them keep the money that they earned. He said, I tell you the truth, that to everyone who has, more will be given. But for one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And by the way, bring the enemies who sent the delegation to, make, to oppose my being king to me so I can kill them. This is a story from Jesus. And he was not talking about killing them with kindness. Jesus expects results with the faith and the things he has given us in life. I don't know if you know uh, what a Pareto um, distribution is, but... Have you ever noticed that there's a whole lot of rich people 
and then it kind of slopes off, and there's a whole bunch of us regular people, and there's a whole lot of poor people. That's like a fact of life. Have you ever noticed that a lot of people have talent, but not everybody can sing, right? Not everybody's got talent. Well, if you took a coin, like this is one of those gold dollar coins, and I gave one to every one of you, and I said, here's the deal. You're going to have a flipping contest. We're going to play what we used to call war when I was a little kid with cards. You flip this coin, and if you get ahead, you win. And if they get a tail, they lose, and they have to give you their coin. And before long, one person will get a whole bunch of coins. And even if they lost a few in a row by random chance, they'd have so many, they'd be protected. And before this was over, one person would have all the coins. That, my friends, is called the game of Monopoly. And it's a real fact of life. That's called the Pareto distribution. Or another word is to call it is the, um, oh, what do they call that? I think I wrote it down somewhere. It's a lopsided law of square roots. There's probably, there's probably 330 million people in America. But how many of those people can play basketball? I ain't one of them. Can, how many of you can play basketball? Okay, none of us apparently can play basketball. Can we take the basketball hoop out of the back then and put it in some parking? The square root of 330 million is about 18,000. So let's say 20,000 people. There's about 20,000 people in America that, are, that have some real basketball talent. But the square root of that is about 135. There's probably about 135 people in the NBA that are at that level, that are that good, that can play. That's the law of square roots. The fact that almost everybody in a certain area is an absolute failure. And then some large, but sm small, but sizable proportion, they're adequate. They can, serve, they can do the job but they're nothing special. And then this very small slither are amazing. The Taylor Swifts of the world. There's a lot of people that can sing. There's probably 20,000 people that can sing. But there's probably only 150 or so people that are truly amazing stars that can do the impossible. And it's true throughout the entire world in every single area. And that is why money tends to accrue, like Jesus said today, those who have, more will be given, and those who do not have, what even they have will be taken away from them. Jesus was not being flippant. He was the creator of the universe. And it's like open the glove compartment of your car and opening the owner's manual. When you read the Bible, and you can find out, oh, you're the one who made this world. It doesn't mean it's fair. It doesn't mean it's how we wish it were. It means this is how it really is. You are a witness to how the world really works. Wow, that was pretty good. All right, would you please rise and join me in the closing hymn, number 96. What we're going to do is we're going to be witnesses right now. We're going to sing about God's praises. We may not be in the 18,000 that can sing well or the 135 that can sing exceptionally well, but we're going to sing loudly. My grandma, Irene Barnes, was the worst singer on the planet. She's dead now, so I don't know who the worst singer is now. But I love that woman to death because she sang with gusto. So we're going to be God's witnesses and sing hymn number 96, 04, A Thousand Tongues to Sing. <laughs>